Many of you are no doubt acquainted with a piece of music known as Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. I notice that after the title on the CD sleeve, there is written the words Adagio Sostenuto, which means that the piece of music should be played with a sustained slowness or gentleness. Now, I deliberately mention this piece of music not only because of the sustained slowness and stillness of the music, which might be suitable maybe for these days in which we're travelling, but because I came across a story recently about Beethoven which touched me and I thought it might be helpful to share it with you. Perhaps you've heard it before, no matter if you have. A friend of Beethoven's, a lady called Dorothea von Erthmann, lost one of her children, then another, then another, until all her children were dead. Not long after the death of her third child, Beethoven invited Dorothea to come to his house. And what happened there, she described later to the composer Felix Mendelssohn. Fortunately, Mendelssohn remembered what Dorothea had recounted to him and wrote down the incident in a letter, which he in turn sent to the composer Joseph Haydn in the summer of 1831. Mendelssohn wrote the following to Haydn, and I quote, She, Dorothea, told me that when she lost her last child, Beethoven was unable to come to her house any more. Finally, he invited her to come to him, and when she came, he sat down at the piano and merely said, We will now converse in music. Beethoven played for over an hour, and, as Dorothea expressed it, Beethoven said everything to me in the music, and also finally gave me consolation. It seems that Beethoven himself prayed during times of depression, disillusionment and anxiety over his intermittent and finally complete deafness. He wrote in his diary, O oh God, God, Look down upon your unhappy Beethoven. Let not things remain so any longer. Help me, for you see that I am forsaken by everyone. O God, my refuge and my rock, O my all. But, thus, but then, just on the edge of complete collapse, it appears that Beethoven attained a kind of tranquillity. He wrote, O God, Serenely will I submit to all these changes, and I will place my whole confidence only in your unchangeable goodness. To have lost his hearing completely must have been a crucifixion for Beethoven. But in this diary entry, I cannot help but hear echoes of Jesus crying in Gethsemane, Abba, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, but let it be as you, not I would have it. Cardinal Christoph Schonborn, the Archbishop of Vienna, writes that Jesus' whole being is expressed in those words, not I, but you, in the total self-abandonment of the I to the you of God the Father. I will return to this idea a little later in this talk. A seven-year-old boy from the US asked Pope Francis during his visit there some years ago now, Pope Francis, if you could do one miracle, what would it be? Francis pondered for a moment and then answered, I would heal children who suffer. It's a mystery to me. I don't have any explanation. Pope Francis is certainly not alone in his silence in the face of the mystery of innocent suffering. I have never found a satisfactory answer to this profound mystery. Why does a young father or mother die of cancer, leaving children behind? Why does an innocent little child die as the result of some rare disease? The only answer anybody can give in these situations is, I don't know. I just don't understand. 
One of the best pieces of pastoral advice I received prior to being ordained a priest was from a fellow Jesuit, Philip Harnett. Sadly, Philip was to die himself of cancer in his early 50s. Philip was giving a talk to a group of us Jesuit students. He gave his advice in the form of a story which he told against himself. He recounted how, just after his own ordination, he was working for the summer as a chaplain in a hospital in New York. One evening, he was called down to be with a young mother whose little child had just died. As you can imagine, the poor woman was beside herself with grief. Philip, still wet behind the ears pastorally, went over to the mother and said what he described to us as the most stupid, pious thing you could say at moments like this. He said to the mother, your little baby is now in heaven, a little angel looking out for you. Well, the mother looked up at him through her tears and suddenly began to punch him in the chest with her fists and began screaming, damn you, damn your God. The ward sister, noticing what had happened, went over to the mother, said absolutely nothing, just put her arms around her and hugged her, allowing the poor mother to give full vent to her anguish. Gradually, the mother calmed somewhat and the ward sister gently guided her to a more private space. Just by watching what the ward sister had done, Philip told us that he had learned a great deal. I've never forgotten that story. Ironically, it was just as well that I had not forgotten it. A mere 10 days after my own ordination, way back in 1988, I went to work as a chaplain for the summer months in one of the major hospitals here in Dublin. Little did I realise that I would be the only full-time Catholic chaplain during these weeks. Thank God we had some little experience of working in hospitals as Jesuit novices, but nothing that would prepare me for what was to come. I was only in the hospital literally 10 minutes when I was called down to the emergency section where the doctors were to turn off the life support machine on an 18 year old boy who had stolen a BMW car the night before and had crashed it while being chased by the Gardaí. I was to recite the prayers for the dying. I was told that the boy's parents and siblings would be in the room. I was terrified. Somehow, I got through the prayers and then the life support machine was turned off. We waited in silence. And then the nurse in charge said to me, Brendan, you take the family down the corridor, stay with them and make them a cup of tea. I was absolutely petrified at this prospect. What could I possibly say to these poor grief-stricken people? Thank God I said nothing. I just made the tea and let them grieve in the silence or in the whispered exchanges among themselves. I remember that the poor mother was so stricken that she could not even hold the teacup, so I ended up feeding her tea with a teaspoon, just like a baby, and she somehow accepted the tea in this way. After what felt like an age, the family got up to leave, and so I walked them in silence to the main entrance of the hospital. When we got there, suddenly the mother turned to me, took my hand and whispered, thank you, Father, for staying with us. I've never forgotten that episode. I was no hero. You all know how difficult it is to be with a person who is in deep grief or suffering. Words fall abysmally, but maybe we should never underestimate the value of our simple presence in the seemingly inadequate silence. Silence can be unguarded, total, generous presence, saying all by saying nothing. So too can silence be in our prayer, 
an apparent listening into the void of God. God does not provide answers to our questions concerning suffering and the existence of evil. It seems to me that what God does, what else could love do? What God does is to enter into our questions. God enters into the pain, the dirt and the danger and takes the kind of body that when it is flogged, suffers and when nails are thrust through it and it is hung up on a roughly hewn cross, dies. This is the very scandal of our Christian faith and yet the very foundation of our Christian hope. What St Paul said in the first letter to the Corinthians, what he called an obstacle to Jews that they cannot get over, to pagans' madness. And yet, as the German Lutheran theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote from his Nazi prison cell, I quote, Only a suffering God can help us when we confront the mystery of suffering. Bonhoeffer continues, Our God is a suffering God, one who bears our sin, pain and anguish. The deepest meaning of the cross of Christ is that there is no suffering on earth that is not also borne by God. End of quote. The Greek word agonia connotes both struggle and anguish. I think that we need to recover the sense of the harsh reality of the cross of Christ. The glory of God was once a wounded man who stumbled, fell and became fully dead. The God who was crucified died not between two candles on the altar, but between two, two thieves in the place of the skull. Surely a theology of the cross cannot be expressed more radically than this. Jesus suffered a secular death, which was profaned to the point of extreme degradation. He died as a condemned criminal by public execution. He suffered crucifixion, that hideous combination of impalement and display. He suffered and died outside the gates, in a place which, from a cultic point of view, counted as totally profane. In St Mark's Gospel, Jesus cries out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's interesting that this, to note that this is the only time in Mark's Gospel that Jesus uses words of scripture to address his father in prayer. For the first time, Jesus speaks to Yahweh as God instead of Abba. Jesus' question suggests a complete sense of isolation. Now he shrieks out that God has left him. Mark lets Jesus die totally alone. The Brazilian theologian Leonardo Boff writes this, and I quote, There is nothing to indicate that Jesus was simply praying a psalm. The text speaks to us of a rending, wrenching cry out of the hell of the experience of the divine absence. Leonardo Boff has a very interesting take on Jesus' cry from the cross, which I feel speaks more to our human experience of sometimes self-surrender in a paradoxical, despairing hope, where we appear to be hoping against all hope. Boff suggests that Jesus' faith did not give way, but that Jesus experienced the darkness and distress of death more deeply than any other man or woman. Jesus does not abandon his God through his suffering a paroxysm of hopelessness, but he feels utterly empty before God. Upon the cross, Jesus hangs naked, helpless, totally empty before mystery. 
Jesus' absolute hope and trust will only be intelligible against the backdrop of his feeling absolute despair. Where despair has abounded, hope can more abound. If Jesus had anything left inside, some faint, perhaps, glimmer of messianic consciousness, then his surrender could not have been complete. He would have been relying on himself. He would not have been completely for God. Jesus' self-surrender for our sake and for God's was so boundless, so complete, that it defeated death's very dominion. This, for Boff, is the meaning of the resurrection, resurrection bursting forth from the very abyss of annihilation. The French novelist Albert Camus, even though he himself was a professed atheist, comments in his novel The Rebel, I quote, The night on Golgotha is so important in the history of man only because in its shadow the divinity abandons its traditional privilege and drank to the last drop despair, including the agony of death. This is an explanation of the Lama Sabachthani and the heart-rending doubt of Christ in agony. The agony would have been mild if it had been alleviated by hopes of eternity. For God to be God, Camus says, he must feel despair. Maybe to finish on a lighter note. Did you ever notice that when the good thief turns to Jesus on the cross, he simply says, Jesus. No one else in the entire New Testament uses this direct and intimate form of address. Commenting upon the passage about the good thief, an ancient author of the church holds an imaginary dialogue with the thief on the cross. The author was clearly puzzled that a mere thief and not one of the doctors of the law has been able to recognise the Lord in his last agony. Had this man taken the trouble to study the Old Testament between his robberies? To this question, the thief simply replied, No, I was a full-time robber. So how then was he able to recognise Jesus? The thief replied, At a certain moment, in my pain and isolation, I found Jesus looking at me, and in his look I understood everything. Jesus asked the Father to forgive those who are nailing him to the cross. This is a startling insight into the nature of God, who uses the cross to assure us that, do what we may, we are loved and forgiven, and that we only have to turn to him to know this is true. There's a famous story from 19th century France of a young military officer who had a bet with some of his colleagues. He was to go to confession in one of the big Paris churches and just pour out all the sins he could think of to the priest in the most vivid and detailed terms. He did just that, thinking that he was very clever. On the other side of the grill, there was a long silence, and eventually the priest said, Now, my son, I want you to go back into the middle of the church in front of the big crucifix over the screen. I want you to look up at the crucifix and say, You did that for me and I don't give a damn. And I want you to go on saying it as long as you can. The young man went back and tried to do as he'd been instructed to do, but he couldn't. In fact, he went off and joined a monastery. The English crime novelist and poet Dorothy L. Sayers tells us this. For whatever reason, God chose, us, chose to make us as he is, limited and subject to suffering and death. God had the honesty and courage 
to take his own medicine. Whatever God, game God is playing with his creation, God has kept his own rules and played fair. God can exact nothing from us that God has not exacted from God's self. What game was God playing? St. Catherine of Siena just might give us an appropriate response. She writes, The cross would not have been enough to hold him, nor the earth enough to keep the cross upright, nor the nails enough to keep him nailed fast to the cross, unless love held him there first. The English mystic Julian of Norwich would have put it more succinctly. Love was his meaning. It is surely appropriate that the earliest picture we have of the crucifixion is scratched on a wall in Rome. It may be as old as the second century. It is a rather shocking image, a man with a donkey's head strapped and nailed to a cross, and next to the cross a very badly drawn little figure wearing a short tunic of a slave. And scribbled below, below it are the words, Alexamenos worshipping his God. Presumably one of Alexamenos' fellow slaves had scrawled this little cartoon on the wall to make fun of him. But he knew, as Alexamenos knew, that Alexamenos' God was a crucified God. The first Christians had some explaining to do and so do we. In one of the great Christian poems of the 20th century, the second of the four quartets, T.S. Eliot writes, again, in spite of all, we can call these difficult days good. May we be given the grace to feel them as being good, as being graced. <laughs>